Welcome everybody to another amazing episode of Wellness Warriors. Today I have a very special guest, Sharon Brock. We met at a conference a couple of years ago, a women's conference, and uh, at the time Sharon was on her healing journey, so we had definitely had a lot to talk about. And now she's post-journey, her healing journey is behind her, and she's written an amazing book called The Levy Method, and we'll talk about what each of those le letters stand for. Um, Sharon is a certified mindfulness facilitator trained at UCLA Mindful Awareness Research Center. She's also a health and wellness journalist with a master's degree from Columbia University. She teaches mindfulness uh, courses online at corporations, at studios, and with private clients as a mindfulness coach. So welcome. Welcome, Sharon. Nice to see you again. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so I took a peek at your website and a peek at your book, and uh, I think a good place to start would be for you to tell us a little bit about how mindfulness practice affected your healing journey and how, you, how much you benefited from that. Great, thank you. Yeah, so uh, right at the start of my book, I talk about the, how devastated I was after diagnosis. I mean, here I was a health and wellness journalist and a yoga teacher, mindfulness teacher. And, you know, I, I identified with being a healthy person and not the sick person. And um, it was, it was really, really challenging. My anxiety just went through the roof. And um, yeah, I, I suddenly shifted from meditating here and here and there to every single day, multiple hours a day, um, just to kind of find some relief from this anxiety. And the benefit of that was that I was creating this habit of this daily meditation and creating some space in between my mind, like the observer mind and my anxiety. And so I was able to kind of flex my mindfulness muscle, right? And um, learn how to manage my, my emotions during this time. And that's so important. I know with uh, our community, you know, they understand essential number four to heal the emotional wounds and how important it is to get into the parasympathetic mode because we can't heal if we feel like we're being chased by a saber tooth tiger, right? And that's how most of us operate every day, right? Unless we make that conscious effort to get into the mindfulness mode. As a matter of fact, one of the books that we're going through now in our uh, coaching program is uh, Shauna Shapiro's book, Good Morning, I Love You. I don't know if you're familiar with, with her, but yeah, she's really, I love her, her approach about mindfulness. So let's talk a little bit about the neuroscience of stress versus mindfulness. What happens to our body when we're under stress versus when we are mindful and uh, calmer and meditating? Absolutely. So just so everyone knows, um, I used to be a high school biology teacher. And so there's a lot of biology and neuroscience and everything is backed up by, by research in my book. And um, Essentially, when we're triggered and we have the stress response and what happens is we have the amygdala, which is a tiny little organ about almond shape right in between the ears. So it's in the brain and it's triggered like a light switch whenever we feel that we are threatened in any way. And so the problem with the amygdala is that that switch can get flipped really easily because it's essentially our reptilian brain. The amygdala was evolved even before humans evolved on the planet. So we need to recognize that when our amygdala is flipped, we go into fight or flight. We're not, we're like operating as if, you know, we're that we're not from operating from our wise part of our brains, right? And so what mindfulness does, and they've proved this in the at the UCLA Mindful Awareness Research Center is that all we need to do is label something, label this emotion, like anxiety is here. And in the lab at UCLA, they, they, they showed that the activity in the brain shifted from the amygdala to the prefrontal cortex. 
And so that's actually what the first letter of lovey is, is labeling. So the, what we're doing with the label practice, we're, all we're doing is shifting our consciousness from this fight or flight, very ancient part of our brains to our prefrontal cortex, which is right behind the forehead. And, that's, and then we're able to be rational and reasonable and problem solve. And it's our wisdom brain. It's also our compassion brain, part of our brain. And so then we can actually interact with our doctors and nurses and join in, be a part of our healing team, right? Like you want to get your mind on your healing team, <laughs> mm -hmm. be a part of these decisions that are so critical to our lives mm -hmm. rather than just be in a state of chaos all the time. And, um, and then, so once, so back to the uh, kind of the physiology of stress, when the amygdala is flipped, I mean, obviously it's a cascade of biological responses that happen like throughout the body, the, the tension, the inflammation, the adrenaline. So, you know, your adrenals get shot because um, essentially you, you need to prepare your body to run from the tiger, right? But it's not until we shift from the amygdala to the prefrontal cortex, where we're thinking, okay, it's not a tiger running after me. It's just this diagnosis or it's just having chemo tomorrow. You know, it's just, it's just my mind saying, what if this happens? What if that happens? What if, what if, what if, what if? I call it the what if software of the mind, <laughs> right? <laughs> and we can label it. Oh, okay. What if software of the mind is here? Here it is. And just putting a label on it and you can go through the, the lovey method with that. And um, so essentially when we, sh this mindfulness practice shifts us to our prefrontal cortex and allows us, which also calms down the body as well. So shifts you from the sympathetic to the parasympathetic and the whole body relaxes. And then you're able to make those wise decisions as well as your body is able to heal because you can relax enough. The lion is not coming after you. You can relax enough for the body's natural intelligence to kick in. Okay, so L is to label the practice. So that means, yes. so we give our, our anxiety, our stress, our, our feelings, we, we label it, we give it a name so that we're saying, okay, I'm, I'm really stressed right now or I'm feeling really anxious. Is That's what you're referring to? label the practice. Yeah. And one of the keys is instead of using, I am anxious, you mm -hmm. would just say anxiety is here. Okay. Because the idea is that you're not identifying with it. That's great. And you're just seeing it as just this kind of natural phenomenon. You know, emotions are just energies in motion. Right. We don't have to identify with it and they come and they go. Right. And that is actually and it creates a little space, a little perspective. Mm -hmm. If you say, I am anxious, it's in me, right? Mm -hmm. Versus anxiety is here. It's almost like there's a little bit of a gap in between. I love that. Because when, when we talk about the breast cancer tumor, we don't say my tumor or my right. breast cancer. We say the cancer, the tumor. Yeah. And you don't own it, right? It's not part of you. It's just transient and it'll be here and gone. And just that little tiny little tweak just how that affects your nervous system right mm -hmm. you disidentify and so actually that does go into oh quite oh. nicely okay observe <laughs> yeah observe so you yeah so you're saying um anxiety is here you've labeled it and then you observe this emotion you just let it be here you're not pushing it away you're not judging yourself for having it just to let, letting it be what, letting, letting it do whatever it needs to do, whether it's get really strong and then it passes. So with enough, the observed practice is kind of the classic meditation practice of Buddhism. So just so everyone knows, mindfulness stems from Buddhism. It's, you can kind of think of it as like the secular arm of Buddhism. <laughs> Um, so anyone can practice it regardless of what religion you practice. Um, it's just working with the mind as opposed to necessarily a spiritual practice. 
So with the observed practice, it's the classic mindfulness uh, practice in which you take the seat of the observing consciousness and you're just watching your mind as if, as if you're watching a movie. You're getting pers- like as if you're, you know, like third person, like bird's eye view almost. Mm-hmm. And you're just letting these emotions come and go like clouds passing in the sky. Because you know that your emotions are simply energies in motion and they're going to come and they're going to go. I like that. Yeah. And then the next one is value. Yes. Value so practice. The, uh, the next letter is V for value. Valuing. You can actually value this anxiety or whatever emotion you're feeling, anger, depression, whatever it is. You can value it because it actually connects you to every other person on this planet who is feeling anxiety right now as well. Like you're not alone in feeling this. And it's a, it's a natural, normal emotion for emotions to have, for humans to have, right? So the value practice really helps you to stop beating yourself up because so many, there's so much messaging of like, ah, oh, why do I have to be anxious again? I'm such a jerk. You know, you're just kind of adding insult to injury. You're just mm-hmm. creating more suffering by judging yourself. And so the value practice kind of gives yourself a break. Like, okay, you know, I'm going through a hard time and other people would be feeling anxious in this circumstance as well. That's the value practice. Yeah, I like that. And then the next one is E, embrace. Yeah, yeah. So the fourth one is my favorite one. Embrace. Embrace practice. So what do you do? What you do here is you take that emotion and you give it a hug. You embrace it. And so I'm also a trained mindful self-compassion teacher, which is a training out of UC San Diego. And there's a a whole, much, a whole lot of research that talks about rather than pushing away our emotions, we can actually not just observe it and value it, but actually give it some love and say, like, I got you. You know, what do you need, sweetheart? So you're, you're being the loving parent to this little anxiety, like it's a little child. And what happens is it's amazing. It, that energy, again, it's energy in motion, right? It integrates into the body. It integrates. The way I think of it is there's your compassion mind is the ocean and this anxiety is one little drop. Mm. It's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. That's when we get to love ourselves. And then the last one, equanimity. Mm-hmm. Equanimity. That's I said fun. it right. <laughs> yeah. So I had to, I know love is misspelled, but I had to add this final E because the truth is, is the equanimity, which is essentially non-reactivity. You know, that's the easy definition. Equanimity is the kind of the goal of of the lovey method and all of mindfulness in general. And the reason why is because the more we react to any given circumstance, the more we will suffer. Mm. And the less we react, the less we will suffer. And I will say, like, if you don't get anything else out of this podcast, but just this one sentence, this is the most important thing. The biggest breakthrough I had through, you know, my years with cancer is that it wasn't having cancer in my body that caused my suffering. It was my reaction to having cancer Mm -hmm. that caused my suffering. And so when I practiced a tool such as the equanimity mindfulness tool, it reduced my reactivity and my suffering reduced even when I still had cancer in my body, right? Even when my circumstance hadn't changed at all. All I had changed was my relationship to my circumstance. Mm-hmm. So important. So important. Yeah. Because, you know, what, what 
when you get that, that diagnosis, you're flooded with all kinds of pictures and images and emotions of, you know, women, bald headed, sick, dying, you know, all of that. And, you know, all these thoughts in just a few seconds. And it's really a traumatic moment for most women. And so to be able to really pull yourself away from that reaction and calm your body down. And, you know, one of the goals that we have in our community is to teach women, you know, to never fear cancer again. Because once you understand what cancer is, what it's not, and you can learn to manage it, and you have a large measure of control over how your body feels and heals, um, you know, cancer doesn't have to be a scary word. 100%. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And um, another thing that I learned in this, during this time is how powerful my mind is. Because even though I was going through something so intense and extreme, I, I could do these practices and shift my mindset from fear to equanimity, which is like calm and ease mm -hmm. and strength. Yeah. And, and then, it, yeah. And then handle this circumstance with grace. I mean, that's, that's really what equanimity is, is handling a challenging circumstance with grace. And, and then I suffered less. I mean, even now I do lovey all the time for, you know, much smaller circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's just all about that level of reactivity. And it's not that I want to be real clear about equanimity, that it doesn't mean inaction. So let's say you're working with anger. There's been an injustice. Just because you're, you, you put anger into the lovey machine, <laughs> right? Go through it all. Just because you're cultivating this non-reactive mindset, it doesn't mean you just sit back and don't do anything. You know, you still go to that protest. You still take action, whatever it is. You still have that hard conversation, but you're going into action from your wisdom brain rather than your amygdala. Right. I, I think I'd rather be operating from my human brain rather than my like lizard brain. Right. Reptilian yeah, exactly. brain. Yeah. Before Good we point. started, before we started recording, you shared something with me about your mm. healing journey. Um, and I think it's very, very powerful for our community to hear. So you chose the traditional route and you went through some chemotherapy and at the same time you had your mindfulness practices and what was the result of those mindfulness practices while you were going through uh, chemotherapy? Yeah, thank you. I, um, I mean, this is like spoiler, spoiler alert for the book, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's, it was a really incredible surprise and so profound in the mind body connection, because what happened was, um, yes, I, you know, I was doing my chemo treatments every three weeks for a year. And um, my doctor said that the side effects were supposed to be cumulative, cumulative, meaning that they'll get worse and worse as, as we went along. And I, I was doing my mindfulness practices and, you know, giving so much love and compassion to my, my entire body, like down to the cellular level particularly just appreciation for my organs for working so hard and really shifting my entire body from the sympathetic into the parasympathetic. Like you are safe, you are safe, you're in good hands, you are safe, you know? And um, what happened was I had hardly any side effects by in my last couple, two or three sessions of chemo. And as I said, they were supposed to get worse as, as time went along. And it was, it, it felt like a miracle. Like I was like bracing myself for the side effects. And, but I had cultivated so much equanimity, non-reactivity that if I had side effects, I was okay. And if I didn't have side effects, I was okay. Right. That's the whole thing. You're able to roll with it. 
That's mm -hmm. another kind of way to think about equanimity. I'm, I'm able to roll with it. Whatever happens, I can deal with it. You know, either way, I'm cool. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, but that was such a shocking surprise that I actually didn't have physical side effects either. And I think that was, well, I know, at least in my body, that was really kind of evidence of the power of the mindfulness practices and the loving method, that it wasn't just calming my mind, it was also calming my body and shifting it into the parasympathetic so that it could heal and allow the chemotherapy to work even better. Yeah, that's a powerful, powerful testament to, uh, to the work that you're doing and to your method. So Thank very, you. very happy for you and very proud of you for, for doing all that and putting the work in, you know, because it's, it's not something that uh, you just start one day and you're really good at it, right? It's something that you cultivate and you, you know, you really little by little. work, work at it. So, yeah. Well, um, do you have any parting words of wisdom for women that are on an active healing journey? Mm. I can facilitate the equanimity phrase just for a couple of minutes. Would that be helpful? How do you mean facilitate? Like we'll just close our eyes and take a couple deep breaths just so people can know what the practice means. Sure. I'm going to give you a little experience. Okay, so this is tiny snippet of the equanimity practice. Um, you can bring one hand to your heart, one hand to your abdomen and close your eyes. If that feels good to you. Let's take three deep breaths. Inhale through the nose. Exhale out the mouth. And deep inhale. And exhale. And last one, deep inhale. And exhale. Releasing both hands down to the lap. Breathing in and out through the nose naturally. So how we cultivate non-reactivity is by releasing all resistance to our circumstance. All acceptance of our circumstance. So we repeat the phrase, Things are as they are. May I accept things just as they are. Things are as they are. May I accept things just as they are. Continue to repeat the equanimity phrase for another 30 seconds in your mind. And now bring one hand back to your heart, and one hand to your abdomen. Just take one last deep breath, the deep inhale. And exhale. And when you're ready, you can gently open your eyes. I love that. <laughs> yeah. They yeah. are, they are, and may I accept them as they are. That's right. And That's I got to tell you, I had to repeat that phrase 500 times a day for about six months before equanimity was actually being cultivated in the brain, like that neuroplasticity, right. like that habit of mind. Yeah. Very good. 
Oh, well, thanks for sharing, Sharon. It was really fun to be with you and um, yeah. appreciate everything that you're doing to support women and their healing journey. And I know with your, your book and everything that you're doing, I know you'll um, really make a huge impact on the community. And we'll um, obviously post your, your website and your book and everything else that we can for you. So Thank thanks you. for taking the time to be with us. And I just want to say I have a free gift on my website. It's um, audio recordings of every single letter, as well as a couple more. There's an audio recording of something to listen to while you're receiving chemo, if you're going that route. Um, another one working with pain after, um, like with the tumor itself or after surgery. So you just need to go to my website, SharonBrackMindfulness.com. And... Um, yeah, you you can get your free meditations there. That's great. Thank you. Thank you for that gift. Oh, you're so right, welcome. Everybody. Okay. All right, everybody. This is Dr. V sending you a big healing heart hug. Till next time. Bye for now.